the place of this episode in the gospel is very important. The villages of Caesarea Philippi were on the very northern boundary of Israel in Jesus' day, in the area that is now uh, part of the Golan Heights. It was a disputed area then. It is even more disputed now. Uh, but it was at the border between Jews and Gentiles, between uh, Jewish territory and Gentile territory on the other side. And it's there that he asked his disciples, you know, who do people say that I am? Now, the tone of Jesus' question here is very open-ended. And it is a setup for, you know, what is to follow. Their answer is the answer of students who are trying to give, you know, the right answer. So they're reporting to him about what uh, people say about him. He then asks them the direct question, who do you say that I am? And Peter responds with a confession. You are the Messiah. Now, this is the second time in the gospel in which this designation of Jesus as the Messiah has happened. The first is at the very beginning of the gospel where Mark, the storyteller, says, this is the beginning of the good news of Jesus the Christ, that is, Jesus the Messiah. So Peter is now openly and directly identifying what has been implicit throughout the whole story up until this point, which is evidence that Jesus was the one who Mark says at the beginning, namely that he's the Messiah. And Jesus' response is sternly to order them to tell no one about him. Now, the sternness of Jesus' response there is very important in the telling of this story. Then, the statement of the Passion Prophecy is somewhat ambiguous in regard to how it should be told. It may be that it's simply very factual, that he began to teach them. But it may be also that the storyteller's shock and, and dismay at this prophecy is communicated in, in the tone of what he says. That is, they began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected and be killed and after three days to rise again. And that he said all this quite openly. Now, to some degree, I think it's important to recognize what a shock this is in the story. There is nothing that prepares the listeners for this. And so, in one way or another, the storyteller had to express some degree of surprise at this shocking prophecy. Peter's response reflects that. And so, the relationship with Peter here needs to be quite positive. That is, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So that then Jesus' response is a response to the listeners who can identify with Peter in his saying, in effect, you know, this cannot happen to you. No, absolutely not. But Jesus then rebukes Peter in the strongest possible terms. And so don't hesitate to tell this with a high degree of confrontation. Get behind me, Satan. Now, it does not necessarily mean that Jesus is angry at Peter. It may only be that he is simply wanting him to recognize what a radically wrong thing he has stated in rebuking him for this. That is, that it's very important for him to undergo this suffering, this passion, this death, and that that is what is thinking about human things rather than divine things. He then calls the crowd and tells them, all of them, and this includes 
than your listeners. So you want to address all of your listeners as the crowd with the disciples so that they hear it as addressed to them. If anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, the expectation of the Messiah was that the Messiah would recruit an army and that they would follow him into battle. What Jesus says to them is in total contrast. If you want to become my follower, then don't take up your sword. Don't assert yourself or think that you're going to be victorious. Rather, let them deny themselves and take up their cross, their willingness to die for the sake of the kingdom of God and follow me. And that what is at stake here is the willingness to lose your life. As those who save their lives will lose it, but those who lose their lives for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. So the promise is then that those who lose their lives for the sake of the gospel will save it, that this will be the way that they will find life. That this is the greatest profit is to lose your life for the sake of the kingdom of God. So the tone of this is then a tone of Jesus instructing his disciples with passion about this way of nonviolent resistance to evil as the way of his followers. This is then a radically new stage in the gospel story when both the definition of Jesus' role and of what it means to be his followers is radically redefined from normal expectations, then and now.